Amen. At least you tried. Amen. You gave it a good go. Amen. Let's turn to John chapter 13 tonight, Gospel of John chapter 13, and uh, let's look at verse 17 will be our verse tonight. John chapter 13 and verse 17 Jesus said, if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you tonight, Lord. Thank you we can sing songs. And sometimes, Lord, we don't know the songs, but we, we give it our best. And the Bible says to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And so, Father, we can all do that. And we thank you, Father, for the privilege of honoring you and worshiping you here tonight. Thank you for the Wednesday night service. We can get out of the world, come together, and just be a part of a group of people worshiping the Lord and hearing the Word of God. I pray you'd bless us tonight. May your Holy Spirit open the lips of your servant to speak in the heart of every person to receive the Word. And may you magnify yourself and glorify your Son. May you edify your people. May you win the lost to Christ. May you do all your will. We'll thank you, we'll praise you, and we'll give you the glory for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight we begin a new Wednesday evening series entitled, well, what do you know? It is a series that will explore the things which the New Testament tells us we can and should know. It's not going to go over all the things we can and should know, because that's just preaching from Genesis to Revelation. What it will do is look at verses that tell us specifically that we do know, or that we may know, or that we should know. And so it has been said that knowledge is power. And that's true. So think of the power one derives from knowing the Bible. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the what? The power of God unto salvation. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so if knowledge is power, and we have knowledge of the power, that's powerful. Amen? Amen. In chapters 13 through 16, John, uh, of the gospel of John, the Lord Jesus is teaching of many subjects. And in chapter 13 and verse 17 he says, If ye know these things, happy are ye because ye know them. No. Happy are ye if you, what? Do them. And so we learn that two things are necessary for happiness. He said, happy are ye. Two things necessary for happiness. Number one, knowing what the Lord Jesus has taught. And number two, doing what we know. That is a prescription for happiness. Now James concurs as he writes in James 1.22, he says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So knowing is the first part, and doing is the second part. Because James goes on in verse 25 to say, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continue, continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, here it is, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now, I've met quite a few people over the years who knew a lot of Bible verses. But they weren't happy. And they weren't blessed. You know Why? They were not consistent doers of what they knew. It's one thing to know a Bible verse. It's one thing to quote a Bible verse. It's one thing to show off with a Bible verse. But it's another thing to do the Bible verse. The word happy in John chapter 13 verse 17 is the word makarios. It means blessed. And the word blessed in James chapter 1 verse 15 is makarios, which means happy. You get it? Happy and blessed are the same word. And if you're happy, you're blessed, amen? And if you're blessed, you're happy. 
Go with me to Psalm number one. Psalm number one. Psalm number one. Let's look at verse one. Psalm number one. Look what the Bible says. Blessed. Now that Hebrew word also means happy. Psalm 1, verse 1, Blessed or happy is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. So the word for blessed here is the word esher. It means happy or blessed. And I want you to notice in verse 3, what it says, and he shall be like a river planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So, the Old Testament says, if you know the word of God and do the word of God, you're happy or blessed. New Testament says, if you know the word of God and do the word of God, you're happy and blessed. So, if you want to be happy and blessed, what do you have to do? You have to know the word of God and do it. That's a pretty simple prescription for happiness and blessing, isn't it? There are things that knowing will bring power and prosperity and peace of mind to the believer. And I want you to keep in mind that power does not mean you won't have any setbacks. And prosperity does not mean you're going to be rolling in the dough. And peace of mind does not mean there will be no troubles or problems in life. Power means that you, have, you will have an ability to overcome by the power of God. Amen. Prosperity means that you will have what you need when you need it by the grace of God. And peace of mind means that you don't need to fret, fuss, and fume because you have the promises of God. Boy, that's all pretty awesome stuff, isn't it? See, we can have a happy life if we just read the Bible, know the Bible, and do the Bible. Amen. So let's see what we know tonight. The subject tonight, uh, the title of the message is called The Law, but the subject is the Word of God. So let's go to Romans chapter 7, verse 14, and look at something we know. Romans chapter 7 and verse 14. Point number one is this. The law is spiritual. Romans chapter 7, verse 14, for we know, all right? So Paul's saying, hey, Christian, you're supposed to know this. So we know that the law is what? Spiritual. spiritual. But I am carnal, sold under sin. The word spiritual here means supernatural. It means non-carnal. It means of the spirit. Now we, according to what Paul said here, we are carnal or of the flesh. The law is of the spirit. We are natural. The law is supernatural. Now the carnal or the natural man or the man born of the flesh cannot understand the nature of the law nor keep the law because it's spiritual and of the spirit and he is carnal and of the flesh. And so here's the man or woman who is carnal and of the flesh. They want to go over here and understand that which is of the spirit and non-carnal. And they can't. It's a whole different world. See, the carnal or natural man, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So when the natural man, the unsaved man, the man who does not have the Spirit of God within him or within her, when they go to the Word of God, they can't receive it. In other words, they can't drink it in. Instead of being like a sponge that soaks it in, they're like a rock that it bounces off of. They can't receive it, see? And they can't understand it. Why? Because it's not understood naturally. It's not understood fleshly. It's understood spiritually. Because it is spiritual. Now, the, un, the, the man, the unnatural, the natural man can understand what it says. I mean, it know, it, he can understand what the words mean, right? 
I mean, when he looks and he re reads the Bible, he can say, there is, therefore. See, he can read the words. He can know what those words mean. But he can't understand what the words mean, and he can't keep what the words mean. And often he doesn't even like what the word says. See? So he can read it. He can know what the words mean. But he doesn't really care for it because he doesn't like it too much. Why doesn't he like it? Because he can't understand it. See, when you don't understand something, you don't like it. A lot of times we'll find information in our lives that we really don't like until we understand. We'll be in a situation or we'll be dealing with something and we don't like it until we understand it. Once we understand it, then we go, oh, okay, I see. That's what the Bible does. Until you get saved, until you have the Spirit of God who wrote the Bible, you're not going to be able to understand the Bible. Now, the natural man cannot see beyond the surface of the physical regulations and requirements of the law to the spiritual nature and application of the law. So all they see are the regulations and requirements. They can't see what's beyond it. The law is spiritual, and it sheds light on sin. And it shows it for what it really is. And shows what power sin has over the natural man. That's what the Word of God does. The law helps us see sin. As a matter of fact, the purpose of the law is to, according to verse 13 of our text, to make sin become exceeding sinful. Once there's a law, now, see, so you can have sin where, where there's no written law. Okay, let's say uh, um, immorality. You can be involved in immorality, and that's sin just because of sin. it is. It's sin whether there's a law or not, right? But once the law is written, now that immorality is exceeding sinful. Why? Because now you know without a shadow of a doubt, now there's a law, now there's a, a, a stop, see? And it makes it exceeding sinful. Because now you're not just doing something sinful, you're going against what the law says. And so the law came to show us how bad we were. The law is here to help us see we're sinners and how powerful sin is over us. The law does not allow man to minimize sin. The law doesn't let man trivialize sin. And the law doesn't let man deny sin in his life or others. Because every time he turns around, there it is. Saying, guilty. Guilty. If there's no law. See? But as soon as the law comes up, you can't minimize it, trivialize it, or deny it. Now, the law is spiritual in that it is of the Holy Spirit. And the law reveals the holiness and perfection and morality of the true and living God. Amen. People don't think of the law that way. They just think of the law as something that condemns them, and it does. They think of the law as something that regulates them, and it does. They think of the law as something that makes them feel guilty, and it does. But it also reveals the holiness and perfection and morality of the true and living God. Amen. The law was never given in order to bring salvation, but to expose man's need of salvation. Now, the natural man looks at the Word of God and sees words of ink on pages of paper. But in reality, it's much more. The Word of God is unlike any other written word on earth. Amen. There are a lot of pages that have been written, but none like this, none like the Bible. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says this, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now we read that and we go, wow, and, but we don't think about it. The, the word quick means alive and powerful spiritually. And what this verse is saying that, as does a two-edged sword physically, 
The word of God pierces to the very depth of the human soul. You see, a physical sword will pierce, will pierce into your body, and a physical sword can divide uh, bone and marrow and, and tissue, right? Just, but the Bible is saying the word of God, like a two-edged sword, the difference between them is a real sword, a, a physical sword, is just dead. It's a dead piece of metal, and, and it, it can only inflict physical. It can only divide physically. The Bible is saying that the Word of God has the power to pierce to the very depth of the human soul and lay bare the thoughts and intents of the human heart. You see, a sword can go in and open you up and lay bare your insides, and you can see your, your ribs and you can see whatever's in there, you know. But the Bible goes spiritually, cuts deep into the soul of man. And actually is able to cut a path and divide and, in, and show the thoughts and intents of the heart. Boy, that's a powerful thing, isn't it? See, it's spiritual power. And it's spiritual precision. And in the hands of God, it is the scalpel that does the spiritual dissection of the human soul and heart by the skilled heavenly surgeon. The law is spiritual, isn't it? It's a spiritual thing. But number two, I want you to go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Now, as you're turning there, I want to share something with you. My wife received uh, this passage, this quote of a passage of Scripture from somebody, and uh, she asked me what I thought about it. So I'm going to tell you what I thought about it. Because I'm talking here about the Word of God, right? We're talking about the Word of God. Now, we believe that the, the Word of God for the English-speaking people is the King James Bible. And that's a whole study in itself. And uh, it's because of the manuscripts that, they come, that the King James Bible comes from. There's two lines of manuscripts. There's one from the Jews. There's one from the Egyptians. And uh, the King James comes from the line, line of manuscripts that were handled by the Jews and kept by the Jews and God used to preserve. The Alexandrian text comes from Egyptians and they, they worshipped all kind of false gods. That's just like a, this tip of the iceberg, okay? And so he, here's a passage from the, the book of Job and this person, I don't know who it is, but this person was sending this uh, to someone in defense of what's called the flat earth theory. How many of you have heard of the flat earth theory? You know, I thought that went out with Christopher Columbus. Didn't you? But it didn't. There are people that still believe in the 21st century the earth is flat. Uh, and, and, they, and so they sent this scripture saying, look, here in the Bible it says the earth is flat. Now, you really have to stretch to get it out of here, but I'm going to show you the verse, I'm going to read the verse for you that they said. And here's what it says. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place, that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? The earth takes shape like a clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. And so... The person is saying, see, it talks about edges. So flat objects have edges, like a coin has an edge, see? And then it says here that the earth takes shape like a clay under a seal. And we know that a seal is flat. And so they're using, now I said it's weak, but nevertheless, they're trying to take the Bible and they're trying to justify a theory from the scripture. Now I want to say this. This is not the King James Version. I, as soon as I heard that, I said to my wife, I said, that can't be the King James Bible. It's got to be something else. Because the King James Bible doesn't say that. Now, that's the importance of the King James Bible. Amen. Friends, you can get a theory and you could probably go out and find a version of the Bible that will back up what you want. But we're not supposed to believe something and go find a Bible to back it up. We're supposed to go to the Bible and believe what the Bible says. And so, what Bible do you go to? You go to the King James Bible. And so, let me, let me read what, what the King James Bible says. All right? 
Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days and caused the day spring to know his place? He's talking to Job. He's trying to help Job understand how little and teeny weeny he is. That it might, now he's talking about the morning, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth. Now the ends of the earth is different than the edge of the earth. Now the earth has ends. There's the north end and the south end. Right? And so the picture is here, you take a hold of this end of the earth, you take a hold of that end of the earth and you shake it. If I had a beach ball up here, I could have one end of the beach ball and the other end of the beach ball and I could shake it. See? Now, if you look the word up that has been translated into um, ends, you'll find that that word can mean edge. But it only means edge in the idea of extremity. And, it, and, the, and the, dic the dictionary gives the idea of grabbing a bird by the tip of its wing. That's its extremity. And so the King James authors are awesome. Huh? They didn't put edge in there. Because they knew the earth wasn't flat. They put ends in there. Because the ends are the extremities. We talk about from going one end, of the, one end of, the, of the world to the other end of the world. We talk about going from one end to the other end, right? We don't talk about going from one edge to the other edge on the earth. And so just read the King James Bible. It'll help you out. Now what this is talking about, listen, he, what he's doing is he's helping Job understand he's personalizing the morning or the dawn as taking the cover of darkness off the earth and grabbing the ends and shaking the wicked out. And this part about the earth takes shape like clay under a seal, it just, it means that when dawn comes, the dark earth stands out in clear relief as shapeless clay does when stamped with a seal. Okay, here it is. You got a piece of wax, right? It's just a glob of wax. It, you don't really see any definition. But once you press it with a, a seal, now the definition comes out. And he's, that's how it is in the dark. In the dark, you don't see any definition. Right? Everything looks like a big black glob. Really. As soon as the dawn comes, what do you see? You see all the definition. That's what the verse is saying. It's not trying to somehow tell us the earth is flat. But that's why I think it's important what Bible version you use because, Amen. you know, you can get, you can get led astray. That's right. That's right. So we're at, we're at 1 Timothy 1.8, correct? We're at point number two. Not only is the law spiritual, the law is good. Look at 1 Timothy 1.8. But we know, there it is again, we know, or we should know, that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. The law serves another purpose besides exposing sin. It restrains evil. The law, when applied properly and justly, provides a system that rewards compliance and punishes breaking it. It restrains evil. Now, if, I'm, if, if we didn't have any speed limits on any of our streets, it'd be crazy. Wouldn't it? Everybody would go as fast as they wanted to go and drive as recklessly and dangerously as they wanted. But what happens when you put a speed line, a speed, uh, you make a lot of money with tickets. No, when you put a speed limit sign up, it makes people slow down. It restrains evil. Why? Because they know there's a punishment that's going to come if they break that law. So the law only comes to show us we're sinners. The law comes to restrain evil. And the Bible says here that the, the law is good. That means valuable and virtuous. The law, listen, has no feelings. And it does not matter who comes before it. The law is blind and does not see the man. It only sees the matter. The law is good, but men are not. And that's where the problem comes in, isn't it? 
Do you notice what the verse said? But we know that the law is good. If a man use it what? Lawfully. That word lawfully is nom imos. It means legitimately. The problem comes when men try to twist the law and use it for their own sinful advantage. Any law, whether it's the law of God or the law of man, when you try to use the law to your own advantage and twist it to your own need, now you're not using it legitimately. The Bible says, woe to them that call good evil and evil good. See, they're not using the law legitimately. Now, the Bible says that God is no respecter of persons, right? So, God is no respecter of persons, and God wrote the Bible. So, guess what? The Bible is no respecter of persons. When someone comes to the Word of God, it doesn't look at them and see where they're from or how much they make or where they've been or what kind of life they've lived. It doesn't do any of that. It just tells the truth. It's no respecter of persons. It says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It says there's none righteous, no, not one. It said except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It doesn't say except a man be born again unless, and then make all these. No, it just says this is, a how, this is the way it is. Now when you're going down the highway and the speed limit says 70 miles an hour, Praise God, I'm glad they raised it to 70 miles an hour. I remember when it was 55, it took forever to get anywhere. So anyway, you're going down the highway and, and uh, it says 70 miles. It doesn't care what kind of car you're driving. It doesn't care where you're going. It doesn't care what time you have to be there. It doesn't, doesn't care anything about you. It just says, look, you have to drive this fast or this. That's it. It's the fastest you can go. Whoever you are, whatever you're about, that's it. That's how the Word of God is. The Word of God is no respecter of persons, it, and, and it's good. The law is good because God is good, and God applies the law with perfect justice. He cannot be bribed. He cannot be forced. He cannot be cajoled into unrighteous application. He cannot be tricked into carrying out the demands of the law in a preferential treatment for some. Without the law, there's chaos and anarchy on every hand. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1 there. Look at verse 9. Knowing this, see? What do we know in verse 8? The law is good if you use it lawfully. What do we know in verse 9? Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murders of fathers and murders of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. That's who the law is for. The law came because of the fall of Adam and the unrighteousness that followed. If Adam would not have sinned, there'd be no law. There'd be no need of law. There was only one, one law, wasn't there? One law. And man couldn't even keep one law. And so because man couldn't keep one law, God had to start making all these other laws. And man couldn't keep any of them either. The law is good. Nothing wrong with the law. It's man that's not good. It's man that's got the problem. It's our rebellious spirit that rebels against law. You know, the Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. It doesn't care where you come from, what your culture is. It doesn't care what kind of music you like. It doesn't care... If you're some big star in Hollywood, it doesn't care if you're a great athlete. It says if you got long hair, shame on you. But when you're rebellious, you don't want to hear the law, right? But that's who the law was written for, rebellious people. I remember when I was a young teenager, um, my dad made me keep my hair short. And when I grew up, long hair, I mean, the Beatles, you know, they just came over, and the big thing was, I mean, if you really look back, the Beatles didn't have that long hair. 
But nevertheless, it was long hair for the times. And my dad wouldn't let me have long hair. So I'd let my hair grow long in the front and comb it back. And then when I'd go outside, I'd pull it down and have bangs. You know, I was cool. I had bangs, man. There was this one guy in school, his name was Sonny Johnson, still a friend of mine. He had the biggest bangs. Oh, man. His parents, his parents allowed him to have long hair. And he was so cool because he had long hair, big bangs. I mean, big swoopy bangs. And mine are like these little stinky bangs like stuck to my forehead, you know, because that's all I could get. So I said, I said to myself, I said, self, when you get out of high school, I can't wait to get out of high school and grow my hair as long as I want to grow it. Boy, that's a rebellious spirit, isn't it? That's the spirit of man. And so I got out of high school, and guess what I did? I went to college to grow my hair. Rebellious. That's who the law was written for. Rebellious Adam and all of rebellious Adam's rebellious children so that they could know, hey, you're rebellious. Well, how do I know if I'm rebellious? Because here's the law. Are you doing this? No, then you're rebellious. You're a sinner. And the law was given to kind of curb and help us and restrain evil. And it does, doesn't it? The law is good because God is good. The righteous do not fear the law because they're not breaking the law. But the unrighteous fear the law because they are breaking the law. The law is designed to rein in those who are rebellious and riotous. Now, what would we do without the law? What if we had no law? Now, our laws in America are based upon the Bible's laws. Now, if the Bible had no laws and, and we have no laws, what would it be like? The Bible says it would be like every man doing that which is right in his own eyes. So if somebody wanted to, to beat you up and break in your house and take your stuff, what are you going to do about it? There's no law. What if you couldn't call the law? Somebody would come and shoot you and shoot your family and move into your house and just throw you out in the backyard and live in your house, eat your food. Well, who, nobody could do anything about it. Why? Because there's no law. The law is good, isn't it? See, there's a practical matter to the law as well as a spiritual matter. And so the law is good and the law is spiritual. And then lastly, number three, the law is perfect. The word of God is forever settled in heaven. And Jesus said not one jot or tittle will pass from it. The Word of God does not need improving, it does not need correction, it does not need enhancement, it doesn't need updating. Today I went to open my laptop and it said, Windows is updating. (laughs) So I had to sit there and wait. And wait. It'll only take a few seconds. Liars. (laughs) A few seconds. The Word of God doesn't need updating, amen? We don't have to bring it up to code. We don't have to bring it up to the 21st century. The Word of God is as eternal as God and was the only thing that was with God in the beginning, according to John chapter 1. And the Bible's called the perfect law of liberty by James. There are no flaws in the Bible. There are no errors in the Bible. And listen to me, there are no contradictions in the Bible. We know the Bible is spiritual. We know the Bible is good. And James tells us the Bible is perfect, so we know the Bible is perfect. You say, well, you know, I, I had this guy, and he showed me a contradiction. When men find what they think are contradictions or errors, it always ends up to be the problem with them, not the problem with the Bible, because if you just do some studying, and you'll find the answer. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. Men have been trying to discredit this book ever since it was penned. And they haven't been able to yet. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Here's this word knowing. Knowing this. Now this type of knowing is he's saying, 
I want you to know this. Knowing this, you need to know this. This is important for you to know this. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture of is, is of any private interpretation. In other words, no one has a corner on the Bible. No group or no, no organization has any inside information that no one else does as to some secrets or hidden interpretations that you can only know if you join them. That's what secret societies are about, isn't it? You want to join them because there's secret knowledge, there's secret wisdom. And some of these organizations even say they have secret knowledge that pertains to the scripture. But they don't. They're liars. Because the Bible says that the scriptures have no private interpretation. It's all a bunch of hooey. Someone look that word up, make sure I'm not. I think it's good. The Bible interprets itself. You know, I get, I get a kick out of people. Now, I understand there's some things that are hard to be understood, but the Bible says we're supposed to study, right? To show yourself approved unto God, or workman that needeth not to be ashamed. What? Rightly dividing the word of truth. So, yeah, there's some stuff that's hard. Take some study, take some prayer, takes going and asking questions and reading and checking stuff out. I understand all that. But I, 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 it's funny. People say, well, you know, the Bible, who, everybody interprets it, interprets it differently. I said, well, interpret this for me. All have sinned. Would you interpret that, please? Interpret this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Interpret that for me. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Interpret that for me. You see, it, it's not all that hard, is it? There's no private interpretation. That's why we're told to read it. And that's why we're told to memorize it. And that's why we're told to study it. And then we're told to do it. Amen. The Holy Spirit is the teacher of the scripture and the interpreter thereof. Amen. Now God has called and gifted and placed pastors, teachers, and evangelists to specialize in studying and teaching the Bible as it is to men as they are. But that's a gift to the local church. And praise the Lord for that. Because how many people have the time to spend all, not all day, but spend in the word of God and checking all this stuff out. But that doesn't mean the pastor is the only one that knows what the Bible says. You know what the Bible says. You can read the Bible. The Holy, when you read the Bible, doesn't the Holy Spirit ever speak to your heart? Doesn't, ever, doesn't anything ever... Like, kind of say, whoa. Amen. Huh? That's right. You know how that happens? That's the Holy Spirit showing you something out of the Bible. That's the Holy Spirit opening your understanding Amen. so you can see it and say, oh, that's cool. Oh, boy, I need to take care of that. Huh? Amen. Yeah. Every born-again child of God has the same Holy Spirit and the same Bible and can read it and understand it if they try. And so we know that the Bible is spiritual. And we know that the Bible is good. And we know that the Bible is perfect and of no private interpretation and that it's eternal. These are things we know. Now, I think that's pretty exciting. I didn't know that before I was saved. But I know it now. What does that do for us? Well, it should give the believer a great confidence and a great faith. See, I have confidence in this book. And so I can check everything out by this. So if you say that and the Bible says this, go ahead and go your way. I'm going to stay here with this Bible. See? Why? I have confidence. Why? Because I know it's spiritual. I know it's good. I know it's perfect. Now, you, I don't know if you're spiritual. And you, I don't know if you're good. And I know you're not perfect. So I'll just kind of stay with this. 
Huh? It should provide for the believer a courage and a strength and a fortitude. We should have courage to stick with this book. We should have courage to say, thus saith the Lord. And when someone says, well, who are you to say that? I'm nobody to say that. I'm just telling you what God said. God said it. Now, if you don't like it, take it up with God. Now, if you're going to talk for yourself and you're going to spout your own theories and things, then you've got to take it on the chin. And you might be wrong, but when you quote the scripture, you're never, ever wrong. It should provide hope by its promises. We always have hope, don't we? We always have hope, no matter how it looks, no matter what we're going through, no matter how it sounds or how it seems, we have hope. Because God said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. He will not forsake you. He's not going to take you out in the wilderness and leave you all by yourself. He's not going to forsake you and say, well, you're on your own now, bub. Have a good day. Of course, you won't have a good day if I'm not with you, but do your best. No. Isn't that awesome? You always have hope. Listen, God can step in in the, in the last nanosecond and do something. Isn't that what he did with the children of Israel when they crossed the Jordan? Remember that? The Jordan was all over its banks. I mean, it looked like Lake Erie. And, and, and God said, now I want you to march across there. And they said, but look at it. It looks like Lake Erie. And God said, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. You just put the priests out, and, and I'm going to divide that for you. You're going to walk across on dry ground. So remember what I did to the Red Sea? I'm going to do the same thing here. So go. Now, it didn't divide ahead of time, right? Mm -mm. They had to go and walk. And as soon as the feet of the priests hit the brink of the water, at the last nanosecond, when everybody was holding their breath and thinking, I wonder if it's going to work. As soon as their feet hit the brink, Amen. that thing was split open and dried out in a nanosecond. Amen. I like that word, nanosecond. <laughs> It's like a second of a second. But what did God require? He required them to believe him and have faith. He required them to do it, right? Just do it. I told you to do it, go do it. But what'll happen? Don't worry about it. I said, well, just go. So it gives us hope. Without the word of God, we really have no objective and unchangeable truth. We would be at the mercy of the wisdom of men and their cunning craftiness if we didn't have the Word of God. Without the Word of God, there would be nothing but darkness and hopelessness and Christlessness, both here and for all eternity, without the Word of God. Without the Word of God, there'd be no America, as we know it. I'm glad that I know the Bible's good. I'm glad that I know the Bible's spiritual, perfect, and eternal. And it is, because God is. These are things we know. Let's bow for a word of prayer. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Maybe you're here tonight and you're a born again Christian. Do you read the Bible? Shouldn't, that shouldn't even be a question for Christians, should it? Do you read the Bible? But it is in the 21st century. How often do you read the Bible? And if you read the Bible, do you believe the Bible? And if you read the Bible and believe the Bible, are you doing the Bible? It's a source of strength and hope and faith and courage and fortitude. Is that how you see it? Or do you just see it as a bunch of regulations and requirements? Oh, my dear friend, those are for your good. But there's so much in there, isn't there? Maybe tonight we need to come and dedicate ourselves and say, Lord, I'm going to read the Bible. Or maybe I'm going to read the Bible more. Or maybe, Lord, I'm going to start doing what I know the Bible has told me to do that I'm not doing. Or maybe, Lord, I'm going to stop doing what the Bible has told me not to do that I am doing. Maybe you're here tonight and you've never been saved. Or maybe you're watching and you've never been born again. Listen, the Word of God is the only place where you can learn how to be saved and go to heaven. 
The Bible says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So if you're not born again, you're not going to see the kingdom of God. That's just simple. I don't care who you are, where you're from, what you're like. If you're not born again, you're not going to see the kingdom of God. And a man gets born again or a woman gets born again by receiving Jesus Christ as their Savior. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. If you want to be born of God, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and receive him as your Savior. That means you confess to him that you're a sinner, that you need a Savior, and that he is the only Savior, and you ask him to forgive your sins and save your soul and come into your heart as your Savior, trusting only in him because there's none other name. If you need to do that, my friend, you're watching and listening, do it right now. Just bow your head and pray and ask the Lord Jesus to forgive your sins and save your soul. Confess to him that you're a sinner and that you believe that he's the only Savior and receive him as such. Father, we thank you tonight, Lord, for the word of God. And the Bible says we know it's spiritual. And thank you that we see that as people who are spiritual, alive spiritually by the new birth. Thank you that we know it's good. And thank you, my Father, that it's perfect. Lord, there's only one thing on this earth that we can count on that will not change and will not fail, and that's the Word of God. Because it has the same attributes as you. And we love you for it. Help us to not only know it, but do it. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, please. We're going to sing our closing hymn, number 482. More about Jesus. Would I know? Well, you know what? You're going to learn more about Jesus if you what? If you read the Bible. And then do it. Let's sing number 482. If you need to come and pray, feel free to do so. If you have any questions about salvation, I'd like to meet you right here. We'll help you with it, all right? 482, you come as the Lord leads. Jesus, would I know more of his grace to others show more of his saving fullness see more of his love who died for me more more about jesus more more about jesus more of his saving When we're carrying it, let's not try to hide it. Let's not be ashamed that we believe the Bible. Not be ashamed to carry the Bible. Not be ashamed to quote the Bible from time to time. You know, you can quote it to unsaved people too. All you need to do is say, yeah, you know, the Bible says something about that. It says. And they'll look at you like, oh. Yeah, and then it's alive. Remember, it's quick and powerful. It can, it can start dividing and cutting asunder to the very depth of the soul and to the very depths of their heart, and they don't even know it. So let's, let's stick with the Bible. Let's know it. Let's do it. Let's use it. All right, we're going to sing that second stanza. If you need to come, feel free. More about Jesus, let me learn more of his holy Spirit of God, my teacher, be showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness. See. More of his love who died for me more about jesus on his throne riches and glory all his own more of his kingdom sure increase more of his coming prince of peace more more about 
Would you close us in prayer, please? Thank you, Father, for your word that we have this book that is alive in our lives, and we know it. Father, no other book has impacted the world like the word of God has, Father God. And so, Lord, help us to not just read it, but help us to live it and help us to do it and help us to share it with those who are dying in the lost and dying world, Father God. Uh, just help us to take a stand for what is right, especially in these last days, Lord, when so much compromise is, is taking place and churches are as compromising the word of God and uh, Father God help Grace of Calvary to stand for the truth protect this ministry here Lord God and uh, Father help us as uh, as uh, members here of Grace of Calvary uh, to share Grace of Calvary uh, to a lost and dying world but more importantly to share the word of God with a lost and dying world we'll praise you and thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ amen prayer time to follow service <laughs>